let's pick up where I left off from last time. It's perhaps the most underrated component in the entire chain, but also one of the most important. As I said before, cartridge produces very weak signal and we need something to make the signal stronger, in other words, amplify the signal. If you put your ear right next to the cartridge, you can actually hear the song that's recorded on the record. I'm gonna try to capture the recording with my mic. And that's why we need preamplifiers. In case of turntables, it's called phono preamplifier or ad amplifier. Different types of cartridges need different types of amplification. The strongest signal is put out by ceramic cartridges between 100 and 1000 millivolts, give or take. So you don't actually need a phono preamp for ceramics. Simple line-in usually does the job perfectly fine. Moving magnet and moving iron cartridges need to be amplified a bit more. They put out between 1 and 10 millivolts and they need a phono preamp. Then we've got MC cartridges. There are two types of MC cards, low and high output. High output MC cards are very similar to moving magnet and the simple phono preamp is enough. Low output MCs, however, put out voltage well below 1 millivolt and need a special type of preamp called ad amplifier. Now, there are a couple ways to get the turntable signal amplified. First, and the cheapest one, is a preamplifier integrated into a turntable. It's usually rubbish, but you can connect the turntable directly to your speakers or headphones without needing anything else. Turntables with integrated phono preamp may have an option to switch between the integrated and external phono preamp. An external phono preamp is almost always much higher quality, but it can get quite pricey if you're looking for the top quality. Now don't mix up a preamplifier and phono preamplifier. I've already explained what a preamplifier is in part 2 of this series. A phono preamp can be either part of an integrated amplifier or part of a preamplifier, or it can be a standalone thing. When you're choosing one of these, make sure it can handle your type of cartridge. Generally, if they have phono preamp, you can always use moving magnet or moving iron cartridges, but not always moving coil. Well, you can technically use low output MC cards on a device that can handle only MM card, but you'll have to crank up the volume quite substantially and they will introduce lots of noise. But I'd always go for something that can handle MC cards in case I'd want to upgrade in the future. There are a couple of different ways you can connect your turntable to a preamp. The obvious one is of course through RCA connectors, which is most common connection. You can find them pretty much everywhere. Some higher end and top of the line models use RCA as well as XLR connectors. But if you want to use Bluetooth speakers or USB, then it is out of the question. Now the turntable itself. When we take out the tone arm of the equation, we left off with a bass, a platter and some damping part. All of these are important to keep unwanted vibrations off the record. Good damping is a first step to isolate environmental vibrations when you're listening to music and somebody's running about the room or a train running outside your window is shaking your entire house you may hear it in the music if the damping sucks. Take a listen. Take these chains from my heart and set me free. Next what you need is a sturdy and heavy bass to dampen the vibrations even more. Heavier bass is certainly better, but you don't need something like this, unless you live next to an active volcano. But in that case you've got perhaps another concern than if your music is playing alright. Next we've got a platter. A platter should be somewhat heavy for two reasons. Again, isolating vibrations and open to keep records playing at constant speed. Heavier platter has a better inertia, so there's a lower chance you may notice any speed changes in the sound, not that there should be any. That being said, there are three speeds you can come across when using a turntable. 33 RPM, 45 RPM and 78 RPM. 33 is a standard for 12 inch LPs. You can find some LPs that need 45 RPM, but most common speed is 33. 45 RPM is usually for 7 inch discs, again you can find some 7 inch records that need 33 RPM. And finally 78 RPM is used for old 10 inch discs, also called shellac records. They are not produced anymore and thus most turntables feature only 33 or 45 RPM speed. 
Also, shellac records have much bigger groove and you need different cartridge for that. Belt driven is, as the name implies, driven by a rubber belt. The motor is connected to the platter by a rubber belt which is wrapped around the platter itself or some of its part. In direct drive, on the other hand, the motor is directly connected to the platter. The motor either sits directly under the platter and is connected to the platter with some shaft or sits somewhere else and uses cogwheels to drive the platter. So, is there some reason to get one over the other? Absolutely not. Some say the belt isolates the platter from motor's vibrations and noise and even though it may technically be true, I've never had this sort of problem with any direct drive turntable, even some cheaper ones. What may cause some problems though, is an old belt. Rubber gets perished or stretched with age that makes the belt slip and that causes pitch changes. The solution is quite easy, just replace the belt for a new one. What you might consider when looking for a turntable is if you want automatic or manual. Fully manual turntable means you have to start the turntable, drop the tone arm yourself as well as lift it after the record is at the end of the groove, return the tone arm and turn the turntable off. Automatic turntables, on the other hand, have a vast range of different, let's say, levels of automaticness. From turntables that can only lift up the tone arm after the record is at the end, to turntables that do pretty much everything for you, maybe even make a tea. Some turntables can even be programmed to play only some tracks, or loop tracks you fancy, or skip tracks, etc, etc. Pretty much just like CDs, but a bit slower. Some of these may get quite pricey though, even in a sorry state such as this one. There are lots of accessories for turntables out there, some of which is a useless crap. For instance, record mats. Mats are supposed to further reduce vibrations, and even though they may look nicer than the mats that came with the turntable, there's absolutely no audible difference. Many audiophiles will swear on their children's lives they can hear the difference, but... Clamps are used to hold the records down. If the record is warped, it may help to straighten it a bit, thus help the tone arm to work a bit less. Original inner paper sleeves won't scratch your record, as some people like to say, but they can get somehow damaged with age or get mouldy, musty or dirty. New inner sleeve can help with that, moreover most of the time they are antistatic nowadays. And that brings me to cleaning accessories. To get the best out of your record, it needs to be clean of all the dust and crap. Nobody wants to listen to the infamous pops and clicks. The cheapest and easiest way to do that is with a carbon fiber brush. It's rather efficient, cheap and cleans the record very well, unless the dirt in the groove is somewhat baked in. In that case you can try wet method. Just spray a solution on the record and clean it with a piece of microfiber cloth. Rather effective method is this brush you place somewhere on your turntable, drop the brush on the record and just play the record. It cleans it on its own automatically, it's brilliant. There's it another, a bit more expensive method, ultrasonic. I've never tried that, but it's supposed to be rather efficient. What is, however, extremely important is a stylus brush. The stylus gets dirty pretty quickly, and when it does, it may sound absolutely horrendous. You just need to brush off the dirt very gently, and you need to do it pretty much every time you play a record. If you want your vinyl records to last forever, never ever grab them like this androgynous thing over here. What can be quite interesting but also quite expensive when collecting records is getting different pressings of the same album. Different releases use different pressing factories, different sources and of course different mastering. You may end up with five same albums but each of them sounding differently. Turntables are a niche market nowadays, getting a dedicated engineer and a factory would cost too much, so today's turntables either cost nothing and are rubbish, or cost an arm and a leg and still can't reach the quality of the top of the line vintage turntables. I'd always prefer vintage over anything new. I've got this turntable Yamaha YP400 for 50 quid in an excellent condition and with the original cartridge included. It's no state of the art turntable, but it's very good and costs almost nothing. Let's stray into a sort of flame warrior field and let me ask a question. 
Isn't audio quality of a vinyl record better than that of a CD or even a SACD? And before I answer this question, let's have a gander at some technical facts. Humans are capable of hearing frequencies between 20Hz and 20kHz. Moreover, the lowest and highest frequencies from this range can usually be heard only by small children, and certainly not all children are there, it gets worse and worse with age. Sure, as always, there can be some exceptions, some people can hear even higher or lower frequencies, but there's almost non-existent percentage, so it doesn't matter really. Adult human hearing is far worse than that of a child. In my case, I can hear frequencies between 30Hz and 16kHz, give or take, and I can consider myself lucky. Now, CDs being digital, frequency response is quite straightforward, between 5Hz and 20kHz. Vinyl records are analog, and as such, they are a bit more difficult to measure, but the lower end should be also somewhere around 5Hz, and upper end is pretty much unlimited which makes either CD or vinyl record far exceed my own hearing, and pretty much hearing of 99.99% .99 of the population. Since the human hearing capability is far worse than what either CDs or vinyl records produce, nobody can hear the difference concerning the frequency response. Where you can hear the difference, however, is the noise, dynamic range and stereo separation. As for the noise, I'm not talking about vinyl pops and clicks, but rather surface noise. Since the vinyl records need direct contact with the stylus, it doesn't pick up just the music, but also the noise. CDs being digital and laser not touching the CD, the only noise you can get, apart from what's recorded on the CD, is from the electronics inside the CD player, which would be next to nothing if the CD player is any good. Stereo separation means how well are both channels separated without one bleeding over to the other. For instance, if you've got an instrument that should be playing only in the right channel, you don't want to hear it in the left channel, do you? This is measured in decibels, and I'd say anything under 20 decibels, the coverage is rubbish. 22, 25 decibels is okay, 25 to 30 is very good, 30 to 35 is excellent, and anything higher than 35 is stellar. Stereo separation of the CD is 90 decibels, so there's practically no chance one channel can bleed over to the other. In short, dynamic range is a difference between quietest and loudest bits you can hear. Vinyl Records dynamic range is at best 70 decibels. That means if you've got a song that exceeds this range, you won't be able to hear either loudest or quietest bits depending on how the record was mastered. CD's dynamic range is 96 dB and with some differing it can rise up to 115 decibels. So the CD is technically able to store much more information. Why did I say technically you ask? Well, if the CD is mastered properly, there's no way the vinyl record can sound any better than the CD, but there's one thing called loudness wars that may have shuffled the cards a bit. In short, starting early 90s, music producers started releasing CDs with extremely high loudness and compression. Loudest parts were kept loudest until the point of clipping, and the quietest parts were increased in volume so they sort of reached the volume of the loudest part. In the end, the track was so extremely compressed, it lost all dynamics and pretty much every part of the track ended up in the same volume level. The track then sounded very bad, with lots of distortion, no dynamics and everything sort of blended together, there was no instrument separation or soundstage. And that's probably the reason why people believe the vinyl records are superior to the CDs. I've got no idea why anybody would do that, since everybody with a working hearing system can tell it's objectively shite. If the vinyl gets scratched, it pretty much always affects the output no matter how deep the scratch is. Deeper the scratch, the worse it gets. You can still hear the track, but it may introduce some noise, distortion, cracks and pops, it may even skip, but unless you made it all somehow, the music's still there. CD, on the other hand, is usually quite resistant to scratches, up to some point when it's not. When a CD player can't read some portion of a CD, it uses error correction to sort of fix what's not there. Again, it works up to some point, if there's too much missing data, you won't hear the track in a lower quality as with the vinyl record, but rather nonsense generated by the CD player. To get rid of the scratches, CDs can be polished, if the scratches are not too deep of course. From a technical standpoint, a CD is just far superior to a vinyl record that is. That all being said, is it worth buying vinyl records then? Well, yes and no. It's rather difficult to conclude this part. Collecting records can be very expensive hobby. If you fancy some contemporary artists, you can support them by buying their records. If you like old stuff, 
You probably end up buying records from whoever sells them secondhand, either online or in some secondhand shops. Either way, this hobby is getting quite expensive lately, mostly the old stuff. Playing a record is a bit inconvenient. It involves you to get up, take the record out of the sleeve, place it on a turntable, drop the tone arm, and after approximately 14 minutes you need to do that again with the other side of the record. Moreover, you need to keep them clean, you need some place to store them properly, and they are prone to wear. Same goes for a cartridge. After some number of plate records, the tip of the cartridge gets worn out, and you need to replace either the entire cartridge or the tip, if the cartridge is capable of doing that. CDs can hold more than 70 minutes of audio, they're more convenient for playback, they're a lot smaller, and you don't need so much space to store them. Most convenient way is, of course, streaming, or playing files from your computer, or phone, or whatever device. But, old vinyl records were mastered a lot better than CDs, so generally, you'll get much better quality than later CD remasters. And that's probably the only quote-unquote feature that makes records better than CDs, but the most important one. So, to me, it's definitely worth buying vinyl records, at least the old ones. Anything produced on vinyl record today will probably sound inferior to other audio formats. There you have it, a complete guide. If you feel like it, leave a comment and see you in the next part. Cheers.